Thank you, everyone. So I'm up first. So I call them the Donnas. So myself and the Donnas went to this amazing conference in Rome. What a gig that was. And we spent two days learning all kinds of amazing things, which resulted in two publications, which I'll tell you about momentarily. And so we encapsulated all that we learned into a 60-minute talk, didn't we? So we decided what we thought was the most important things we wanted to tell you about it, but we're hoping very soon when the publication is available, perhaps as soon as later this month, that you'll read it because it's amazing. Okay, so giving it your best shot. That's me and my disclosures, and our slides are uploaded now to the version you're going to see now. So I'm going to talk about skin thickness, avoiding IM injections, needle length, which is always controversial, proper use of insulin pens and syringes, which is also controversial with pens these days, and addressing injection pain, fear, and anxiety. So this is about the FITTER conference. I just want to make you a little jealous if I can. Uh, we did not stay there. <laughs> there was 183 clinicians from multiple different uh, practices, specialties, and disciplines from 54 countries, and in addition, 15,000 people attended virtually. Quite a few of them are in this room. Uh, we reviewed over 750 papers, I'm not joking, and we reviewed data from a large insulin injection technique survey, and I'm going to show you some of the data from that sur uh, survey because it's very interesting, and use that information to draft an evidence-based recommendation for safe and effective injections of insulin. So just to give you an idea of how vast this was, these are all the countries that are represented. The larger the blue ball, the more participants from that country. There was over 13,000 participants from 42 countries. And although the survey was patient self-reports, in addition, almost half of the patients were also observed by an RN. And what's going to be really interesting soon is when you see the difference between what the patient said and what the nurse saw. That's no surprise to anyone in this room, right? I didn't think so. They don't just lie in New York, right? <laughs> We're very crafty in New York, the sin of omission. Okay, so the first survey result, which I thought was fascinating, is how do people take their insulin? So it turns out globally that over 85% of patients use insulin pens. Isn't that great? But for some reason, the U.S. is lower than that. What do you think it is? There's one word answer. What is it? Reimbursement. There you go. So we, we have uh, almost 10% still using syringes and then combinations. As far as injection sites, I was very surprised at this data that almost 91% use the abdomen. I often have trouble selling the abdomen and have to sometimes cry in bed to get people to try it, but once they do, they love it. Uh, what I'm sad about the most in this slide is that 31.9% are using the arm. What do you think happens when someone uses their arm? Where are they putting the needle? Probably in the muscle, which will be talked about soon by my colleagues. How many injections a day was also surprising in a good way that about a third of people take four shots a day. I don't know who they are because I have very few of them, but I think that's great. I, they're supposed to maybe do that, but they don't. Uh, only 16% take one shot a day. That does not reflect what I commonly see. It's much higher for the one shot a day. But it, it makes me happy to see that so many people are doing intensive management. You have one quarter doing two shots a day. So here's the fun one. What the patient says versus what the nurse saw. So I highlighted some of my favorites that 16% uh, said they had an 8 millimeter needle. And in truth, it was almost double. And interestingly... They less reported that they were using the 4 millimeter. So 28% actually used the 4 millimeter. So skin thickness, uh, we, we learned in all of the data that we reviewed, varies from 1.25 to 3.25 millimeters, with the mean being 2 to 2.5, but it's slightly less in children. And this is the best part. The 4 millimeter pen needle is safe and effective for all patients. 
Now, I have a lot of trouble with patients that I meet, especially in the hospital, who are just finding out that they have diabetes and God knows what else that they came in for, and selling them to go home on insulin is a very hard sell. So if I were to walk in with an 8-millimeter needle, I think a lot of them would never do it. So the 4-millimeter needle is very reassuring to me that I can offer it to everyone because that's something that I'm more likely to get the patient to go home and do and do all of the times they're supposed to. I'm sure many of you have had that experience when you show them the tiny needle. They're like, wow, that's it? It's all good, right? And I'm not going to say everything on my slides because I have very little time, which is probably half gone. Oh, it is. Okay, so care of the injection site. So it's recommended for patients that they only disinfect if the site is not clean, but that they shouldn't inject through clothing. And that's actually a good reminder because I have seen people try to inject through jeans and and thick clothing. Uh, In the hospital, though, where infections can spread easily, we do recommend alcohol and let it dry. Um, Don is going to talk more about the lipohypertrophy and so on. Insulin pens uh, should be primed. How many think their patients prime their pens every time they take an injection? Raise your hand. Do you look around the room? You see no hands have gone up. So priming is also a very hard sell. They don't want to waste the insulin. But I, I'm now, since I've gone to Rome and learned all of these things that happen when you don't prime, and Donna, the second Donna, I have two Donnas. Didn't you have a patient with a 60-unit air pocket in their pen? I'm not making this up. I have the witness. 60-unit air pocket from a patient that never primed. So it's pretty compelling reason that it's really important, first of all, to find out that the needle has been properly placed and is working and that there's no air. Um, never sharing pens, that seems very intuitive, but there's been some terrible stories you've read about in the news where hospitals are sending letters to thousands of patients telling them that they need to get checked for hepatitis and HIV. Can you imagine getting a letter like that? So many hospitals have gone away from pens. How many are using pens in your institution now? Raise your hand. Okay, that's not a lot. Okay, so now raise your hand if you were using pens, but you were told to stop using pens. Oh, not too many. Well, my hand should go up for that because I don't have pens any longer. There will be a report coming out soon from the ISMP, which will actually be in favor of pens if we do certain things, which I'll talk about soon. Um, Using the pen needle once and removing immediately is also something that most patients don't do, and I've met people that leave the same needle on for weeks, which is quite scary. Uh, the second, uh, the last thing I want to mention on this is the counting to 10 is really important. And I like to show patients when I teach them, and I'm sure many of you do the same thing, when you, when you actually push it down and pull it out prematurely and they can see how much insulin leaks is very compelling. And I love the practice pillar for that because you can really see what's leaking on it. So that's a good thing to do. Uh-oh. So... Um, To address pain, fear, and anxiety, uh, recommending the 4-millimeter pen needle or the 6-millimeter syringe needle is really going to help patients who are nervous about the injection. Of course, the fear of pain is only one component of why people don't want to take injections, but that's an important one. Injecting at room temperature so it's more comfortable. I really want to stress the third bullet, though. I don't think we think about this enough over time. We may teach someone initially, and then they're taking insulin, and we think everything's fine. But just for fun, I like to ask people to show me over time, and I'm shocked and amazed at what I see over time, and especially as your patients age and have issues with cognition. And my most amazing story, I'm not making this up, I was asked to see a patient in the ICU who was admitted because her blood sugar kept going up and up and up, even though she was calling her endocrinologist and she was getting insulin increased doses every day, and it kept going up and up and up. And I came in and I started to ask her to, you know, what have you been doing? Show me. And she said, oh, I found a new way to take insulin. She has this big grin on her face. I said, oh, maybe I'll learn something. Let me see your new way. And I'm sorry, Christine, because I told you the story at lunch. You have to hear it again. Uh, she took the pen and she put the needle on. Great. And she did her air shock. Great. And she dialed the correct dose. Isn't this terrific? And then she put it in the practice pillow and moved her hand and dialed it all the way down, pushed it, and pulled it out. So she had injected nothing. And right after she met with me, she got discharged because there was nothing wrong with her. She was just doing her new method. It's pretty amazing. And I found out how many of you know Jerry Spollett. She had the same story she told to happen with the patient. So this is not a new thing. How many have heard this before? Look at that. Oh, my God. 
Amazing. Okay, so um, talking to patients about the benefits of insulin and there's no limit with insulin to get to the A1C they would desire is a very important benefit. And as far as addressing fear, I like to use safety needles for patients that are really scared of needles because they don't see the needle at all. I also like to use safety needles for patients with manual dexterity problems because it's nice and bulky and it's easy to turn it on and off. I laugh because sometimes it takes me longer to teach the patient how to take the needle and put it on and off the pen than all of the rest of the instruction about how to use the pen. I could sit and spend five, ten minutes just on getting the needle off. So the safety needle is actually a lot easier to screw on and off. So that's something to think about. And then I saw this cute little device. How many know Buzzy the Bee? Look at that. I had never seen it before, but it's very exciting to me. It has a little ice pack and it vibrates. So it's very helpful for people who are frightened. So my summary. For adults, uh, just a couple of key points. Avoiding injecting into intradermal and intramuscular spaces, and Donna's going to talk more about that. Using the 4-millimeter pen needle at a 90-degree angle, no pen, straight in for all adults. Uh, Whenever you use a needle length for a syringe or a pen greater than 5 millimeters, so 6 millimeters or higher, you should actually lift up. which sites to recommend and to rotate the sites. And Donna's going to spend a lot of time talking about why that's important. And for children, a little bit different, but um, again, avoiding injecting into intradermal and IM spaces. And it's harder with children not to get IM. So you do want for uh, children and young adults to use the four millimeter pen needles and the two finger lifted skin fold to prevent the IM injection. So this is the uh, citation for the publication. That I, there's going to be two papers. They're going to be published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in September, but I believe they're going to be available online as soon as by the end of this month. Am I right about that, BD friends? Yeah, I think very soon it'll, it'll come up. So watch for it. It's really a good read. I found it fascinating. And when you see all the other survey data, there's a lot of interesting things in there, things you always wondered about will be answered. So now we move on to Donna Jornsay, who's going to talk to you about Seek and Ye Shall Find, Assessment, Treatment, and Prevention of Lipohypertrophy. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Jane. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you today and with my esteemed colleagues, Jane and Donna. This isn't working. That isn't working. I'm not going to be more than 15 minutes. <laughs> so there I am, and my disclosures. And now let's talk a little bit about lipi- lipohypertrophy. We've heard a lot about this, but not enough. And even more importantly, it's amazing. I went to my primary care doctor just last week and made a comment to her that I wanted her to document in my medical record that I had lipohypertrophy. And her response to me was, you have what? Can you spell that? And I was really distressed. I've been injecting or infusing insulin for the last almost 48 years, and I was very distressed thinking about how many people come through my primary care doctor's office who have been injecting insulin or maybe a GLP-1 injecting something, and she had no idea what I was talking about when I said lipohypertrophy. So it is a disorder of fat, and there are really two kinds. Lipoatrophy, which we don't see as much of now as we used to with animal insulins, and then lipohypertrophy, which is really enlargement of those adocytes and swelling or induration of fat. So what is the prevalence? And this is amazing to me, given the fact that it's going largely undetected, that we have a prevalence around the world somewhere between 49 and 64 percent, and yet we're not really addressing this as a major issue. And it has significant consequences with glycemic control, with glycemic variability. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. So when we look at it, where is the most common site? The most common site is in the abdomen. And 
that it's followed by the thigh and then the arm. And it's frequently, frequently reported in patients who are using insulin pump therapy. And those in insulin pump therapy are largely using one anatomic site. They're rarely putting that pump site into their arm or into their leg, and much more commonly using their abdomen. So when we looked at a study that was presented, um, that was done by, by Dr. Pickup in 2014 and his colleagues, they looked at 91 pumpers and saw that um, lipohypertrophy was present in over 26% of those pumpers, and it was associated with a longer duration of pump use, as you could imagine, and also, um, well, let's leave it at that for now, a longer duration of pump use. So these are some of the problems that we see with insulin pump use. And certainly this is another topic, another area that has been dramatically neglected in terms of study. And I know that myself, as well as other colleagues, I take an allergy pills, which make me very dry. Um, but it is definitely understudied. And the person on the right-hand side of that slide, I'm sure those of you who have puppers in your practice have seen those kind of dots all over the belly, which I call the connect the dot syndrome. And pumpers really hate that because who wants to have a belly that looks like that? And cellulitis, we see many problems. But certainly sight or infusion problems are not limited to pumpers alone. They exist in people using multiple injections. And here are some very graphic depictions of what lipohypertrophy can look like. So those patients who, and I have had patients say to me, oh, that's my fat. And they keep injecting into that same spot and wondering why they're not getting the same result. So some of what I'm going to be able to show you answers that question. So what are the risk factors for the development of lipohypertrophy? It's the duration of insulin use. Somebody like myself who has type 1 diabetes, I don't have an option, but to, as I get older, the duration of insulin use is going to continue to increase. So that's one issue. But what about site rotation? And we really need to be instructing our patients to inject into broader areas with specific injection patterns that I'll talk about a little later, too. So the failure to use a systematic approach to site rotation is also a risk factor for lipohypertrophy. And then another risk factor that I think we as healthcare professionals have totally undervalued um, is the fact that needle reuse is also significantly associated with the development of lipohypertrophy. So this is a patient who I saw, um, I'm a nurse practitioner, but work now as an inpatient diabetes clinical specialist. So I'm not doing nurse practitioner functions anymore. And so I see patients one day a week, one evening a week in a private endocrinology at practice to keep up my skills. And I literally saw this patient in practice about nine months ago, and this was her left arm. Dramatic, isn't it? And I said to her, is it okay if I take a picture of this arm? I'm giving a talk on this. I need your arm. So short of bringing her here, we took a photo of that arm. But this is her non-dominant arm, and she was injecting for years in that same spot. And it bothered her enormously because she looks very unbalanced. Her right arm is not impacted like this. And she also admitted to common needle reuse, and most distressing, had no idea that that practice was in any way impacting what was going on with her arm. She has good insurance coverage, but... Well, why would I use a needle only once if I could use it two or three or four or five or seven times? So I think this is a big 
um, issue that we as educators really need to do a better job at educating our patients about. So I want to talk to you about a study that was presented in a poster last year at the ADA. And it really is a remarkable study because it's the first study that really addresses pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics as related to lipohypertrophy. So it was a randomized single center study with 13 type 1 patients who were getting two injections, and it was a glucose clamp study, two injections either into normal adipose tissue or into lipohypertrophied tissue. And then let me show you those results. So what you see here is that the difference, and we do have a pointer here. If you look here, whoop, that just advanced it, didn't it? Okay, let's try this. You can see the difference. There I go. Yeah, I am technology challenged. (laughs) But the absorption of insulin is decreased by as much as 34%. I'm a very concrete person, and I like to be very concrete when I talk to patients. So when I talk to them, I say to them, that means if you injected 10 units, you were getting the benefit of 6.6 units. And if you really needed 10, what is going to happen when you show those glucose results to your provider or when, if you're managing yourself, you increase that dose of insulin? So patients would keep increasing the dose of insulin And then one day, they inject into what I call virgin territory. (laughs) And that's when they get admitted to one of our institutions with severe hypoglycemia because all of a sudden they got the full benefit of that dose of insulin. So this same euglycemic clamp study also showed us that the first four hours There are pharmacodynamic challenges with a reduction of 27% by injecting into that lipohypertrophied tissue. This is really important because this is the first time we had a concrete number that we can associate with the practice that we know is going on, but that we haven't been able previously to quantify. So I want you to remember that 34% reduction in insulin absorption when injected into lipohypertrophied tissue. So going back to the insulin technique um, questionnaire that Jane cited to you, globally we had over 13,000 patients. Most of them, the majority, were type 1. And we looked at the percentage of patients in this um, questionnaire who reported lipohypertrophy versus those who, where lipohypertrophy was detected either by visual examination or palpation by the nurse. And the frequency with which, and the, the issue I'm going to address first here is how often are those of us who are using insulin actually having an examination of our injection or infusion sites by a healthcare provider? Not nearly often enough. So, Only 28% of patients are routinely having their sites examined. And 39%, and I am in that 39%, who has never had an infusion or injection site, and I have good doctors, caring people who care about my glycemic control, and yet no one has ever examined those injection or infusion sites. So when patients were asked, do you have swelling or lumps at the injection site, 29% reported that they did. So a third of patients, roughly, had some awareness that this was an issue for them. Then when the nurse examined them, the percentage went up a little. But in this case, patients and nurses' perceptions were relatively close, in that 29% of patients were self-reporting, and a little, and a, right around 31% were seen by the nurse to have lipohypertrophy. So this is a common finding, most commonly found in the abdomen. So what did we learn from this insulin technique questionnaire? We learned that roughly a third of our patients worldwide have lipohypertrophy. 
and that roughly 40% of those patients with lipohypertrophy are regularly injecting into that lipohypertrophy tissue. So when you see the glucose variability, when you are analyzing blood glucose data, I want you to think of this first, because this is a simple fix. If we can examine sites, we can solve a problem that is very, very common with diabetes management. It's most common in people with type 1. It's most common in people who are using more injections. It's most common in people who are reusing needles and in those who haven't taught or are not practicing good rotation technique. Injecting into this is going to reduce our insulin absorption, remember, by 34%, and increase 20% higher insulin doses. That has a cost factor associated with it. In our current economic environment where people worry about and they get into the donut hole with their Medicare, simply getting them away from their lipohypertrophy tissue may save them on the amount of insulin that they need. And it also will decrease their A1C by up to a half a percent. Lipohypertrophy is associated with all of the insulins that are currently available. We don't yet have data to tell us what is the impact with all the GLP-1s that are being injected, but I think that's something else that will need to be studied. It is also associated with some suboptimal practices, most namely insulin reuse and poor injection rotation, and has the potentially harmful effects of people being underdosed on insulin, and then if they switch to that virgin territory, having severe hypoglycemia. And although it is con- lipohypertrophy is present at what is seriously epidemic rates, it is going largely undetected. So we have a job to be doing, and a much, and we need to be doing that much better than we currently are. So our recommendations to you as diabetes care providers are using broad injection zones, using a pattern, a W or an X to follow so people understand that, examining infusion sites at every visit, and teaching patients that their insulin dose will be reduced by up to 34%. Now, next up is my colleague, Donna Tomke, former president of our national organization. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and it's really my honor to be here. Oh, I thought this was on. Okay, we'll try again. Where am I going? Is this working? Sorry, I've got to um, get my slides queued up. Okay, thank you. Well, it's my honor to be here, and I'm actually humbled because what we learned in two days, we're trying to present to you within, with, uh, within the 60-minute period. And um, what I can say is times they are changing, and the good news, we have evidence that's helping us change our practice. And by the end of this presentation, I think you'll see that the evidence is pretty compelling that we probably need to change our practice. So my next presentation is going to be on the strategies that reduce insulin infusion set problems. Here are my disclosures. And what I'm going to discuss is the importance of insulin pump infusion sets, the detection, uh, treatment, and prevention of infusion set problems, including unexplained hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, insulin precipitation, flow reliability, integument issues, cannula length, and current and future guidelines for insulin infusion sets. First of all, how many of you do pump management or pump training? Okay. So you're going to really relate to this part. So... We've had pumps for over 30 years, right? And if you think about it, pumps are not just a pump. It's a system. 
you have your pump, you have your infusion, you have your reservoir, and you have your fusion line and the, the actual catheter. So if any part of that fails, you've got a problem. And the infusion sets are required to deliver that insulin into the subcutaneous tissue. And unfortunately, the role of the infusion sets are often underappreciated by healthcare professionals because where they're overshadowed by the pumps. In fact, I was in the exhibit hall and saw really new features and great stuff on the pump. And um, so we had how many pump companies, but we don't have that. We don't even think about the infusion sets until we're ready to train the patient. Which one are you going to choose? You're going to choose this one or that one? So uh, often we forget about that until the last minute. But unfortunately, in that system, if anything fails, you have uh, all kinds of problems, and the complications can uh, be from the infusion side themselves, technical problems, as well as metabolic problems. So if nothing else, remember the infusion sets are the Achilles heel of pump therapy. Now, I love this quote. It was by Dr. Aaron Kowalski, the chief medical officer and vice president of research for JDRF. He said, the worst part about wearing a pump is an infusion site. It hurts to insert. It gets inflamed. You get kinking of the cannula. And using a CGM, I'm just shocked by how frequently this happens. What probably is happening, to some degree, is we're not getting the insulin dosing that we think we are. Have any of you noticed this? Now that you're wearing CGM with a pump, I personally wear a CGM and I wear a pump, and it is shocking how often you go up and down and you're really saying what's going on. So if we look at some of the causes of unexplained hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, we know that the infusion um, infusion set, insulin infusion set is one of those. Kinking, occlusion, uh, air, dislodgement, all of those things can occur. And then we often have to think about the insulin. Is it stable? Does it precipitate? We have to think about that because that could be a cause of hyperglycemia. Skin irritations, including infections, inflammation, infusion site problems are another area that we have to uh, think about and certainly help our patients with. And then Donna so nicely presented the lipohypertrophy problems, which are very common in pumps. And then, of course, the pump can fail itself, and then the user error. And believe me, if it can go wrong, someone will figure it out. So the user error is, a, is sometimes a problem. So what I did in this slide is take um, the multinational um, questionnaire. It was worldwide, as Jane was saying, um, and I pared it down to what are users doing in the United States. And I was kind of surprised by the information that I saw is the infusion set composition, 75% are Teflon or, you know, um, plastic or polymer versus 25% steel. And I know in my practice, I often will switch a person to steel uh, catheter because they have a lot of problems with infusion, um, clogging, um, silent occlusions. So that was one of the things we saw. In terms of insulin type, 71% is using the rapid acting analogs versus 29, almost 30% short acting human insulin. And I think a lot of that is probably coming about because a lot of people are using our Medicare and cost of insulin is very, very high. So that was kind of surprising. In terms of frequency of changing their sites, um, this is not surprising to me. Um, the Teflon um, people change them every 3.4 days versus steel is changed almost every five days, which was really uh, interesting is almost 50% of the steel users reported changing them once a week. So why do we have problems with hyperglycemia? Yes. <laughs> One in 10 uh, users report changing their infusion set early at least once a month due to hyperglycemia. And, you know, we think about how infusion sets are painful, but it's really not as common as we thought. 
So if we look at infusion site complications of uh, pump therapy, um, this is a really nice uh, study and slide by um, Conwell and all. They took 50 um, pediatric children and adolescents uh, with type 1 diabetes, and they looked at the dermatological complications that were present. And surprisingly, 94% had micro scars, or those small scars that were less than 3 millimeter diameter. Uh, 66% had erythema, and 86% of those being mildly severe. Uh, 42% had erythema, erythematous nodules, and look at the lipohypertrophy, 44%. And these were in children and adolescents, so think about your adults. And then you've got the bruising and cellulitis that wasn't really evident, but we know that occurs. And there was a less severity with 90 degree angle infusion sets. So the root question is how often should people be changing their infusion sets? Unfortunately, we don't have any guidelines that say do this, do that, and what is the evidence behind those guidelines? Well, we do have some uh, evidence that um, on the third day, infusion sets start or pro- infusion sets start causing problems with bruising, itching, swelling, and pain. So that is commonly the reason people are not pushing it longer than that. And by five days, 40% of the patients experience significant skin challenges. And so I think we all pretty much follow the manufacturer's suggestion of changing their uh, patients changing their catheters every 48. To 72 hours. So that really doesn't tell us for sure how often people should be changing their sites. Now, this is a patient of mine that I saw last week, and she came in and said almost identically what is on this slide that I prepared in April. So I see, I hear this all the time. I eat the same thing day to day, activity is the same, routine is the same. Why are my blood sugars so different? What's going on? Does anyone hear that? Yeah, all the time. And then here's another comment. Problems um, I notice are high blood sugars after, I just got the six minute sign. (laughs) Infusion set change. It's not anything new, but in fact, it has been going on for a very long time. I've tried many things to offset my uh, the high numbers without resolution. I fasted for eight hours after a set change. Still, my numbers went to the low 200s and stayed there for eight hours. So basically, people get very, very frustrated with these kind of problems. The commonest infusion set failure is kinking, blockage, and it occurs more often if the sites are left in longer than three days. Occlusions, whether they're silent or you get an alarm, If you have a failure, no matter if it's a septic tank or an infusion pump set, occlusions are potentially dangerous. Now, this is a a slide where it shows that red staining is really the insulin precipitating on the outer wall of the infusion catheter. So is this a problem uh, of unexplained hyperglycemia? So in this uh, slide, David Kerr and all did a a laboratory study. They looked at the three rapid-acting analogs in pump users, and they found there was no difference between the three insulins in occlusion rate during the first 72 hours. But after the 72 hours, there was a dramatic increase in occlusions, particularly with glulysine, 41%. Aspart, insulin aspart, 9%, and Lyspro, 6%. So their recommendations are that you should be changing the site every two hours, I mean, 72 hours, excuse me, two hours, forget it. Um, In terms of what is common in our practice, I agree with Earl Hirsch, who presented some of this data. It's very common. And uh, in one study, 30% of the uh, subjects had at least one occlusion alarm leading to hyperglycemia during a 13-week period, while 60% had unexplained hyperglycemia. And that means where you didn't get an alarm, but the the, uh, glucose rose. 
And then another report about 15% failure rate after the initial insertion set. And so anecdotally, the longer the patients are on pump therapy, the more problems they have. This slide shows, this is a great slide, um, it really evaluates the flow reliability in preclinical and clinical studies. You can see a little Yorkshire pig hooked up to pumps and pressure um, um, sensors. And what it really shows is that within less than 300 minutes, 200 minutes, you're seeing some rise in pressure and flow interruption. So this really shows that we see silent occlusions, and that is uh, defined as a continuous rise in inline pressure, which occurs for greater than 30 minutes. That does not trigger that alarm. So this is really important data. Uh, We saw six or seven other slides that showed similar data. But what came out of this with the support of the JDRF and the Helmsley Foundation they, uh, along with, uh, with that support, BD has developed a novel catheter that may reduce silent occlusions. And you might have been able to see it uh, showcased today, this um, conference in the exhibit hall. But what's really exciting about that is that it has a side port. It's, it's brilliant. You know, the insulin has to exit out of the uh, catheter in the end but now they've developed a redundant port, so if you have an occlusion, hopefully you have a second exit if if that should occur. So what they saw in uh, their um, clinical trials is that they reduced the uh, infusion set occlusion problems, silent occlusions, by more than 75%. So this may be something that we can start using that will reduce e- these incidents of silent occlusions. Are there guidelines? Not yet. They're coming. But this is the closest we have from the ADA in EAS- EASD statement, where they say, you know, use the glulysine two days and no longer than five days of aspart in an insulin infusion pump. And so there's really no specific recommendations for the frequency of site changes, and they also call for more transparency for for pump manufacturers on the compatibility of specific insulin formulation and insulin sets. So other infusion set problems, we know they occur. The leakage at infusion set pump connections, lipohypertrophy, we already heard about site infections, bleeding, bruising, and pump malfunctions. So lipohypertrophy, we know it exists. Everyone should be inspecting, and I have been looking for it, and I know it is prevalent at 50% rate in my practice. And I'm just, I'm just shocked because all I do, if I do one exam, the whole, the whole um, visit, it's let me see your sites. And it's amazing how often I see lipohypertrophy. You know these kind of problems. They occur. And then you might ask, well, what's the optimal length of a cannula? Well, that we don't know for sure, but it's similar to the needle length. And because a pump infusion set has to reside there, you know, under the, uh, subcut- under the skin, for three days, it's recommended a six millimeter penetration is adequate because it does not uh, prov- um, put the patient at risk for an IM insertion. So six millimeter is really recommended. So what's the importance of the fitter and the call to action? It's really about educating you to go out and educate your your colleagues, because insulin infusion sets are a problem, and we now have options. It's very important that we get site rotation. I know I'm out of time. <laughs> Sorry. And there's, you know, troubleshooting. We have to troubleshoot. And we know there is a significance of unexplained hyperglycemia, and we do have problems related to the skin and lipohypertrophy. 
So what's coming next and available now? Um, well, the fitter, the publication is in press, and I think it's going to be out in September, and that will really give us some concise set of guidelines for patients and healthcare professionals worldwide, so we can actually be doing the same thing. And it will increase the consistency of delivery of insulin and other diabetes medications in the subcutaneous space. There is actually a very good article that was published in the Diabetes Educator by Evert and all. It was called Improving Patient Experience and with Insulin Infusion Sets, a Practical Guideline and Future Direction. So I would encourage you to look at that. And then I love the community of interest the diabetes technology community of interest. I tell you, I get so many great ideas. Someone poses a a question, and guess what? You've got 10 or 20 people responding. So if you haven't, if you're having a problem with something, pose your question. If you have questions about some of the issues, go online and look at them, because they're just fabulous. So in summary, all of our evidence has not been there. It's been anecdotal experience. It's been, tradi- it's been based on tradition, not science. But now we have science, which is really, really cool. And um, infusion sets are still the Achilles heel of pump therapy. And it's even going to be more important as we close the loop. And we do know that we have skin challenges and occlusion problems that we have, we have to solve and this is, has been our greatest gap in our technology. But the good news, we have innovative technologies that suggest an improvement um, of correcting or changing those unexplained hyperglycemic episodes. The BC, BD Flow Smart has broad implications, and our evidence-based recommendations can provide foundations for concise guidelines for all involved in insulin delivery. So now we're ready for questions. Um, We would love to hear your questions, and we, yes, we would love you to step up to the mic and ask them. Thank you. I just just wanted to give you one heads up that BD, um, I know the booth is closed, but they have some wonderful aids to help us with teaching to patients. So there's a lipo pad. If you haven't had the opportunity to get one of these, you could contact your local rep. And there's also Tom Kajaya, who's standing up front, has some little site rotation guides. He doesn't have a lot, so run and assault him as soon as you can. And then um, I also put together, for those of you who like handouts, I have about 50 copies up here at the end. Anybody else can email me, and I'll send it to you electronically. For This is designed for patients. Thank you. So we'll entertain questions. My question. Um, do you want to be up? I can stay up here. Go ahead. So whoever has a question, step up to the microphone on both sides. And I, I'd start here. Give me your name, your affiliation, and your question. My name is Patricia Byrne. My question has to do with uh, once you uh, see a patient that has profound lipohypertrophy um, and you know that moving the site is going to increase the insulin absorption, do you counsel them to decrease their dose by any set percent? I usually say to be cautious to decrease the dose by like 20% and just do some additional monitoring. Um, I actually and that's totally unevidence-based. <laughs> I was going to say I actually had a patient who had significant lipohypertrophy. And, um, you know, I looked at his overall dose and I reduced about 50%. So you really do have to think about reducing the insulin uh, if you're going to get them in the virgin areas. I see. I, just one more thing. I have seen people that um, 
rather than a uh, what looks like fatty tissue, it's kind of like a hard crust. Have you ever seen yeah, that? Yeah, I have. I don't know what you call it, but it it is the same. It's it's an abnormality of the fat that's been caused by overuse, and in some people it gets lumpy and harder, and in other people it doesn't. So. And we've also observed one of my pediatric colleagues, which is very interesting to me, has seen lipohypertrophy developing in kids who have been on insulin for only two years. I think so, people four months. Yes. Yeah, so we're not real sure about all of what contributes to lipohypertrophy. I've been on a pump for 38 years and using CGM for 12 years. Donna has been on a pump almost as long. I've got lipohypertrophy. She does it. Right. So who knows what is that critical issue that contributes to the development? It may be there may be some genetic component to this that we just don't understand yet. So Thank we're going to go to the next question. Thank you. On this side. Hi, I'm, I'm Rosanna Hannum, and I am at Sutter Medical Center in Sacramento, and I have a large uh, pediatric practice. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I, we have a lot of lipohypertrophy, obviously, with kids, and it's easy to tell them to switch to another site. I've had a few kids with the lipoatrophy, and I don't know what to do with these kids because it almost seems like it never heals, and so we're running out of spots to put yeah. the insulin. Yeah, I, I know, and I, I, feel, I feel that because none of us wants to advise anybody to grow new geography. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> That's right. it is a problem. You know, I um, mean, what we used to say with lipoatrophy was that if you inject it into the middle of it, it would start to fill up. But I don't even know, um, and I don't know if anybody in the audience has had any experience with doing that, but I don't have, I wish I had a solution okay, for you. Sure. Well, I, I was going to say, I actually had this in, in an adult, and it was very unusual. We switched the type of insulin, you know, from one, I think she was using Lyspro, we switched her to Aspart, and it actually did get better. So, you know, that's, if you have it's funny, exactly. I'm like, let's try another one. Let's try yeah. another one. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. then, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe this side. Um, I was wondering, actually, one Your name? Minute. Oh, sorry. My name is Angela. I am actually from here in San Diego and nice. work for the Sharp Healthcare System. So, um, I see a lot of patients with hypertrophy. I was wondering, how long does it take for them to, uh, for that to recover? Is there and a... some people staying away from the site if it isn't long duration for three to six months will get it to resolve somewhat. I've not been back to some sites on my abdomen for 25 years, and it hasn't resolved at all. So I'm, I'm go sorry, figure. I know this is, but is it related to volume, too? So people who are getting a higher units per hour are more likely to get it? Or? Um, I, I don't. Do we have any evidence about that, Dr. Hirsch? Do we know any evidence that it's related to higher volume insulin doses? I didn't think we did. So I don't think we have the evidence to support that. But perhaps, you know, moving forward, we will have that evidence. And perhaps some of the more concentrated insulins that we're using now that are being delivered in smaller volumes, maybe we'll see that from that. But thank you. I wish I had more answers for you guys. I really do. Here. I can identify the problem. I just don't have a lot of solutions. Hi, I'm Lori Sim from Auburn, Washington, and I work in a community health center, and so I'm kind of on my own as a diabetes educator there. But uh, can you just, it's a change of subject here, but can you um, advise on how to troubleshoot for when patients are um, having bruising at the site? And we're talking traditional or pen injections, not pumps. Um, what I mean, I've asked about, you know, are you changing and using a new needle every time, all those questions, and some people just seems to have it. What is What would I be looking for? How do I well, unfortunately, I don't know if you've got a, a geriatric or older person taking um, warfarin or something like that, you're going to have more of that. But, yeah, but not. Uh, I basically, you know, look at, I, I actually ask them to apply some pressure, and sometimes that helps. Uh, if it's a, if, you know, after their injection, mm -hmm. not only do they inject and hold for 10 seconds, mm -hmm. but then apply the okay. pressure, which seems to help some. Okay. Um, 
The other thing that I do Mike, Mike. is oh. the other thing that I do is if you have somebody inject, what we frequently do because we're not necessarily lifting up a skin fold anymore, we inject, then the person pulls out the needle. And if you think about the physics of this, you're dragging that tissue as you pull out. So I have people inject and then make a V around the injection so you're stabilizing the mm -hmm. adjacent skin, pull the needle out, then release the V. Okay. And that sometimes stops with the, stops the bruising. Okay, thank you very much. I also have seen people that have bruising that are re really aggressive in the way they inject. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like they're throwing a dart. Yeah. And sometimes when I get them to stop going wham, it gets better. So that, observe their technique first. Just Decide. wondering if there was a fat bank we could donate Your name, donate please? To. That's Mary Beth Intrusi. <laughs> Hi, Mary Beth. Hi. Where are you from? San, well, from the same place you're from, but uh, <laughs> I live in San Francisco. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering about if anybody had experience with Flonase, using it for irritated Ooh, skin I did. Yeah. under mm. the catheters and... Have you used it? Have you tried? No, but I have. Actually, um, the community of interest, the type diabetes technology. That's what I saw. <laughs> yeah, and I actually have a patient using it. You know, she gets the, the you know, she does a snort up her nose. She uses it just for her, um, um, her uh, sight. You know, she applies it before she puts the tape, or she has a lot of problems with the uh, CGM, the Dexcom. So it's seeming to work. Is it? Okay, yeah. I mean, that's just one technique. You know, there's. When people have those kind of problems, you just have to get really creative. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Go in here. Hi, I'm Patty. I'm from Washington State, and I'm just getting into assisting people with insulin injecting and all that kind of thing. And I had a client that um, told me she had some firmness in um, her upper arms, where she's injects every day um, and I figured right away that it was lipohypertrophy but I didn't really know what to do um, and and then I and then the muscle issue I wanted to hear a little bit more about that and so, so do you want to answer the muscle issue I, you know, I got text of my Fitbit, and I didn't hear the question. Oh, you, um, yeah, I'll answer it. My, I heard my the watch question. was vibrating, and it distracted um, me. I think she's got to move to a new area. She's got to stay away from that. And people have a tendency, because it is very difficult to reach the back of your fat on your arm, they have a tendency to do what is essentially an intramuscular injection when you're using the front of your arm. So she, I would really recommend her away from her arms onto her belly. Okay. The other technique you can use on arms is leaning up against <laughs> the door or something that will push the subcutaneous fat at the back of your arm forward so you have access to it. Okay. Okay, and yes. I did mention to her. sitting at a table. Pushing to the table. Pushing, pushing to the okay. table. I did ask her about... Um, using her abdomen, and she had some resistance to that, but I didn't really dig deeper, so we'll have you to know, do that. You, you know, um, I would just say just inspect everything and, you know, look at everything and just show them all the areas. You know, so often they don't even think about their, up, you know, outer flank, hip, or their, you know, upper thigh, that sort of thing. Um, so I would just get really creative. I always say, okay, here comes the exam, show me. You know, sometimes they're dropping their pants, you know, whatever. But, you know, it, it, it's very, very impact, you know, okay. empowering. Thank We're, you so much. We are almost out of time, so I'm going to take one more, and then the rest of you could come up and we'll talk to you. How's that? So over here. Hi, I'm Linda from Seattle. And I wanted to make a comment. The, the skin thickness data from BD came out many years ago, and I did a program at a hospital talking about the 12-millimeter needle and risk for variability, but many big hospital systems are still using 12-millimeter needles, and I'm curious, is this data, how, <laughs> how are we going to influence large systems to make this change to switch to smaller? Oh, I, I think yeah. when, when the paper comes out and you can show them, 
about, about, first of all, in a hospital, I think it's even more important to have a smaller needle because many patients are going on insulin for the first time in the hospital. Many of them learn they have diabetes or they have to be on more intensive therapy now. And you're going to in, introduce them to insulin, and their experience with insulin is the 12.7 millimeter needle, which I, by the way, call the ex-boyfriend needle. So <laughs> people remember that, my interns. But, but most systems are still so using So you want them. to have them have a good experience with insulin so they go home and do it. So I, I think it's a fight that we need to fight. So the guidelines are going to help you. It's going to show you why it's absolutely not necessary to do that. Um, we just made the switch uh, maybe a year and a half ago at my health system, a 22 hospital health system, Northwell Health. We switched to the six millimeters. Just so you know, having personally in service every nurse in the entire, excuse my French friggin' hospital, <laughs> every nurse, um, with the help of BD personnel for that six millimeter needle, I had nurses calling me up and saying to me, something's wrong, the needle got broken off, it's too short. <laughs> and so we really had to do extensive in-servicing, but we have seen, which is very interesting, our hypoglycemia data system-wide has gone down, which is really the indicator of how often those injections were intramuscular injections, speeding up insulin absorption. Thank you. So for Donna, the people we didn't get to. Oh. <laughs> yes, Could you Lynn. quickly, one of the best things you ever taught me was how to do a physical assessment of someone's sight to um, uh, detect. Okay. Would you please take a moment about that, please? Yes, I will do that without getting naked, Lynn. Do you, do you want um, to use now, Donna what, uh, yes, I'll use my friend Donna here as a model. So ideally, you're going to do this oh with ultrasound gel, if you have it, because that really makes a difference. It makes it much easier. But when I was talking to my PCP and trying to get her to record in my note that I had lipohypertrophy, she's going at me like this. Should be three fingers flat. So if I'm looking at Donna's belly, I'm using three fingers flat. I've put ultrasound gel on her, and I'm feeling down. And what you will feel is these it almost feels like rubber bands underneath the skin, or you'll feel an obvious lump. And those of you who haven't felt it, I welcome you coming up to our little lipo pad here. Lipo Larry, have you all ever met Lipo Larry? He's a dear friend of BD's, and he was unavailable to come to this meeting. I don't know why, because Jane married him last year. No, no, we broke up. He, he broke he the broke engagement. Up. So we just have the mini Lipo Larry. But I have these all through my own institution and have bedside nurses now that are doing better jobs at assessing for lipohypertrophy than many of the providers are in my neck of the woods. So it's really something you can learn. And look at how many questions there were about lipo. This is a huge problem and something that we haven't addressed and that we all, I think, need to be on the front line of pushing this agenda forward. So yeah. thank you all for your attention. Thank you.